returns for them so they can pay their long-term obligation to retirees. Um, so we look for long-term opportunities that were a 25-year fund where we could stay with an infrastructure asset, build a transit system or a roadway, and be able to have a return for those um, pension fund investors. Uh, we're relatively agnostic. As we look at the market, and I think our competitors the same way, uh, we don't expect to impact uh, public policy making in any region. Our expectation is that uh, there is the need for these kinds of debates, these kinds of forums, uh, to sort through what the right fit is for any metropolitan region. We see the same debate happening in, in New York and Dallas and San Francisco around the, around the country. One unique thing about California that we like in particular, I think the market likes, is that um, you guys have been great innovators in looking at the use of public-private partnerships. Uh, you've had the SR91, uh, which was a variable pricing HOV lane, um, sort of a great experiment uh, with a unique history. Um, you had the SR125 down in San Diego, which went bankrupt, and that showed the resiliency of this model. The concession model, many people think, was created as sort of a privatization of government uh, activity. In reality, is it was a response to frustrations that were happening in, in Great Britain, uh, happening in Australia, about the government's inability to deal with uh, control over private sector performance. So the frustrations, as you could probably well understand from some of the big projects that have happened, and California has done a good job on these, but if you look around the country, how do I keep cost and schedule control when I have a big program? You know, you tell somebody it's going to be a billion dollar program and all of a sudden it creeps up to two billion or three billion. Uh, how do I make sure that I have the resources when I build something, we're going to be able to maintain it and, and, and really shift to a culture of maintenance as opposed to letting these things uh, fall apart? Um, how do I make sure I have significant leverage over the lifetime of that asset of what the private sector has built for me? And the concession model is just that, as you can imagine. If we build a road or build a transit system, we get paid back through one of two ways. If it's a tolled facility, we're dependent upon our keeping that roadway in good shape over a very long period of time in order to attract uh, riders onto that system. If we're building a transit system or a non-tolled roadway, such as up in the Presidio Parkway in, in San Francisco, uh, we get paid only if we keep that facility up to a standard of care that has been uh, determined by the government. We also have to live with whatever sort of local values are created. So public realm issues like environmental issues right of way, uh, whether we're going to use organized labor or not, those are issues that are largely settled by the government and those, uh, those requirements are put on us. So if you look at the Long Beach Courthouse as an example, it's a 100% union job, but that reflected sort of what the local community was looking for in that places. You look at the jobs we do in Texas, very different labor market, a very little use of union labor. So we're a pretty flexible tool uh, that really can come in once I think the community sets forth and understands what it wants to do. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to, since we're on this topic, I'm going to keep you on the hot seat for a moment, for a moment <laughs> longer. We've heard a little bit this morning about the efforts by the mayor, Supervisor Yaroslavsky, and others in Washington to get this America Fast Forward program going, which would be to give LA County and Metro an advance on the sales tax money under Measure R. Politically unclear whether that's going to get done or not, although I think we're all very hopeful that it will. What, is, what do you see in LA County as a role for public-private uh, partnership as you look uh, here? Is it something that, that works well there? And, that, and where do these types of, what types of projects are best suited for public-private partnerships? Because there's been a lot of debate about um, I, I think public-private partnerships are best suited to, to uh, the, uh, very, very complicated projects. Uh, so if you were thinking about, uh, let's say, the, uh, the 710 uh, South project, which is trying to build some additional capacity for truck movements from the Port of Los Angeles uh, into the greater interstate network to improve that efficiency, one of the questions is, uh, what will the trucking community, the shipping community, be willing to pay for that premium service so that they can get 
uh, their materials to the market much sooner than they otherwise would by standing in, 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 by standing in co congested uh, uh, roadways. Um, the private sector is very good at understanding what that risk is of that demand for those kinds of services. And I think probably in a better position than the government to make that bet on the utilization of that roadway. And don't forget like an SR-125, if you make a mistake on that bet, the facility reverts to the government and no harm, no foul to the, to the government. So that's one mechanism. I think another one is, um, as we saw up in Denver with the Fast Tracks program, which was a major new transit link from downtown Denver to the airport, uh, a very complex set of, of rail systems, operational issues, a lot of interface issues with the freight railroads. Uh, they decided that it was best for them to do a design build up or maintain for a fully new system out to the airport, uh, where really the private sector, and we're not involved in that, uh, where the private sector is not taking the ridership risk because it was an unproven, uh, uh, it was an unproven uh, origin demand route, uh, but rather performance risk. So what Denver has is a fixed price to deliver service over a 35 year period taking all the risks for replacing rail, replacing systems, replacing uh, the, the vehicles uh, over that very long period of time. So from a budgeting perspective, they have certainty. And from a single point of accountability, that system fails to make schedule 15 years from now. Well, guess what? The developer has a significant amount of equity that is going to be penalized uh, by the Denver rapid transit system. So complexity uh, is really the key for what allows government to get best value out of the system. Jill. John, let me ask you a, a question. Uh, we came back to Menton. We talked about congestion pricing. Right. And for people who don't know what congestion pricing is, it's a lane that when everything is very crowded that you could actually pay to use that lane to get somewhere faster. It's like an HOV lane. We're doing one here in Los Angeles. Right. What do you see as the value of those types of projects uh, in reducing traffic, and what are the what are the economic constraints on that? Well, there's there's really there's there's two aspects to it. Um, there's a communications aspect, which is uh, what I was talking about with Carmageddon. You you as you're driving along the road, and maybe you haven't hit the traffic yet, but you see that the price on the toll lane is five dollars instead of one dollar. It says, "Hey, I'm going to get in the toll lane because that five dollars is probably going to save me an hour." Um, so th there's that. The pricing is going to vary to to manage congestion. Nobody's going to pay unless that lane is always free flowing. So the pricing is always going to be managed to create free free flowing traffic. Um, the on the economic side, what pricing the lane does is it gives an opportunity for the private sector to come in and say, hey. I'm willing to invest in creating this new capacity so that I can get a return on this. So it, it, puts, it shifts the risk to the private sector, um, like SR-91, which is now run, it's been taken back by the government of Orange County and it's being managed by, uh, it's still being managed by a private, it's, it's complicated, that was, a, that was an interesting deal, SR-91, but uh, it, anyway, it's, it's, you know, the, the risk is entirely on the private sector. The responsibility for customer service is entirely on the private sector. And they're going to set pricing so that it does two things. It keeps traffic free, free flowing and it attracts customers. Because if they set the pricing too high to, to make their money back, they're going to go out of business, right? Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that, that, that's sort of the goal of setting pricing. Art, I, I see Art and, and Zev over there. You want to jump in on this? <laughs> we've just begun a major project in this area. Well, I'd like to comment a bit on the 91. There are important lessons on the 91, uh, but there are also some things which are construed from it which are perhaps not as correct as one might think. I have a little knowledge about it. I was a CEO of the Orange County Transportation Authority when we did not take it over. No, we bought it. We bought it in the open market. It was a purchase, a voluntary sale. Why was it sold if it was so hot? 
as a private operation because the state had granted a franchise that forbade uh, additional free lanes. That made the, 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 the state and the toll road owner a source of hatred to the people of Riverside County and San Bernardino. Hatred. When I went to Orange County, I was shocked at the antipathy. We bought the road in the open market, and because we were a public agency, the antipathy evaporated. We then implemented a much more aggressive pricing program, congestion management. Tolls went up during peak periods. The peaks got wider because people went to the hours when it was less expensive. So under public ownership, shed of the, of the negative emotion, we raised tolls, revenues were highest in history, volumes highest in history, speeds highest in history, and total passengers highest in history. And the biggest thing of all was the parallel free lanes improved because we took the profits and invested them in the free lanes. That is not a private enterprise activity. That was the OCTA doing that. It's a great model of how things can be done. I do want to comment just a little bit on this, uh, you know, it's fine to be philosopher kings, we're going to do stuff that the public needs because we're smart. But we have this annoying problem in this country. It's really annoying. They're called citizens. <laughs> and we have a problem with community acceptance. The, the SR 710 in Pasadena is not delayed out of technical problems. It's not delayed for a lack of will. It's delayed because there are citizens out there and they're dang electeds who keep creating problems. Now, we, if we just suspend the Constitution for 20 years, we could do some wonderful things here. I will, I will make you an offer right now. You tell me where you want to build the next freeway in Los Angeles, and we'll schedule some meetings out there. And I want you there with me. Okay? I want you there with me. It's going to be great. We're going to have 100-foot arcs right over the neighborhood. It's going to be cool. So come on out with me. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think uh, I just want to pick up where Art left off. Uh, uh, I, I, I could spend a lifetime uh, arguing about, about congestion pricing. Obviously, it works. Uh, uh, reducing taxes to nothing will, in, will increase spending in, in the economy, too, but we don't eliminate taxes completely. And raising taxes reduces expenditures in the economy and slows the economy. We don't typically do that, at least in, the, in this day and age. Anyway, the point is that the... Uh, in, in the Los Angeles metropolitan area, you're not going to build any new highway capacity. I want to get back to uh, uh, to the comment that, that was made uh, by John uh, that, that building new transit lines doesn't doesn't impact traffic. Uh, that's not free from doubt, but let's let's stipulate that that's the case. We don't build transit lines, subways, light rails, Orange Line busways to reduce traffic. We build them to give people an alternative to being stuck in traffic. That's the only reason we build them. Now, it so happens that when we built the Orange Line, the University of California at Berkeley did a study in the first month or six weeks of the operation of the Orange Line and determined, I don't buy their conclusion because I, I don't know how they could figure this out, but they determined that peak hour traffic on the Ventura Freeway was reduced by somewhere between 3 and 4%. The, after the orange line was open. I say I don't buy it because I, I, I don't think that's true, but UC California, UC Berkeley, yeah, it's my son's alma mater, they can't be wrong. <laughs> but even if, they, even if it's uh, not true, we have 25,000 people a day boarding that line who now don't have to, 25% uh, of whom were we're drivers, first-time users of our metro, of our, uh, uh, metro system on the Orange Line. 25% of those people uh, are now leaving the driving to us and leaving the congestion to other people. The subway, and I want, I want to talk about West Los Angeles. The Valley has traffic, but nobody has traffic like West Los Angeles has. Between the 405 freeway and the ocean, in the evening peak, in the PM peak, which starts at about 2.30 in the afternoon and ends at about 7.30 in the evening, it can take you over an hour to traverse that three-mile stretch. Now, I can jog that distance in half that time. I can walk it in less than an hour. So could most of you. An hour to go three miles, 3.4 miles. 
the only way you're going to solve that problem for the commuters and the, 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 the uh, employees who work there and the people who live there is to provide an alternative. You're building no new highways in West Los Angeles. You're building no new highways in the San Fernando Valley. There are going to be no SR-91s out here. SR-91 was built in the middle of nowhere. It connected two points that went through a rural area. Didn't have to condemn anybody's home. I mean, maybe you did. I don't know, but there weren't, there weren't a lot of homes there last time I drove. And, and you didn't have to uh, dislocate businesses. You didn't have to do any of that stuff. So it's one thing to talk about widening, increasing capacity, highway capacity, which I'm all for. But you have to recognize what the limitations are in the metropolitan area. Look at what's happening on the 405 freeway. You know what that whole thing is all about? It's about widening the freeway by one lane. A billion dollars to widen the freeway by one lane, and it's going to turn the quality of life of that corridor upside down for the next four years. Yeah, you want to build a new highway? somewhere in the metropolitan Los Angeles area. It's, uh, it's a different ball game. So I think uh, think tanks are good. And I, uh, you know, Reason Foundation is great. They have some great ideas. The Rand uh, Corporation has great ideas. Uh, but they're talking to themselves. They're not talking to, uh, to real people. And, and they don't. Oh, you have to. Yeah, yeah, you will. I, I want to provoke you. I, I want to see a think tank person get angry. That's, a, that's always what it is. <laughs> But seriously, uh, the, uh, my good friend Martin Wax, at, at, who's worked off and on with the Rand, Rand Corporation, is a big congestion pricing guy. Well, where, and, and congestion pricing on the highways can work, and, and, and selectively they can work, and we're doing one project like that in, in L.A. County now, and I think it's the Harbor Freeway. Uh, but the congestion pricing, the, kinds, the likes of which they did in London, England, where you got to pay 12 bucks or whatever it was just to go into central London. Uh, well, when you guys run for office, uh, and <laughs> you can try that idea. I, I, I don't want to go much longer. i just to tell you a quick story. When I was in the city council, I had this screwball idea that we should have an odd and even license plate thing that when... when uh, w no, no, no. Odd and even license place. So if your last number was, was an odd number, you couldn't drive in, into downtown uh, on, a, uh, uh, on an odd number day. So if, you, if, if, you're, if your license plate ended in one, you couldn't drive on an odd number day. And if it ended in two, you couldn't drive on an even number day. And, uh, and I remember the headline on the Daily News, because I, I made this suggestion at some group like this, small group. I didn't think there was anybody there, but there happened to be a Daily News reporter there. <laughs> and, uh, and the headline, when I got to the office the next morning in the Daily News, big, thick headline, you know, it was bigger than, than VE Day. It was, Yaroslavsky proposes, you know, odd, even thing. And the, the line of people outside my office from city employees when I was in the city, was, was halfway around the corridor, say, I can't do that. I, I, I'm a building inspector. I've got to be out there all the time. I'm, I'm a you know, fire captain. I've got to be there out there all the time. I've got to get to work all the time. This is, uh, this is a very complicated business. And uh, the reason we build transit lines and the reason we've spent 35% of Measure R on transit, the single biggest line item in the, in the Measure R budget on transit, is because it's not because we're, we're amateurs and we haven't done this before. The art hasn't done this before, and his predecessor hasn't done this before. This is the only game in town as far as providing a long-term alternative to being stuck in traffic. Even congestion pricing, if you don't expand the capacity, and you're not going to expand a lot of capacity in the metropolitan area, you're going to end up taking capacity away, as, the, as Jerry Brown did back in 1970 five and 76 with the diamond lane on the Santa Monica freeway. Some of you are old enough to remember that, uh, that experience. They reduced 25% of the capacity of the, of the Santa Monica freeway and it, it created havoc on the surface streets because people couldn't, couldn't move. It was a parking lot. So people got off the freeways and created another problem. Federal judge finally had to, had to uh, suspend that project. I was the plaintiff in that case. <laughs> it's, it's a heady thing. Zev Yaroslavsky versus the United States of America. It was a, that was the case. But uh, it was a terrible idea. Since then, all diamond lanes, all HOV lanes have been added capacity, not reduced capacity. So if you can add capacity, 
and make them into uh, congestion pricing lanes, that has some resonance. But if you can't add capacity, you're not going to widen the Ventura Freeway. That idea was, was tried once before, and it got shot down because a 1,000 homes were going to be destroyed by that widening. Uh, you're not going to widen the 405 Freeway by another two lanes for congestion pricing. So the only way to do congestion pricing on the highways, then, is to reduce the capacity. It's not. <laughs> well, let's, well let's you go, you go heard, make the case. We've heard from both sides on this issue, and a very, good, very, very, very good comments. I want to make sure that people in the audience have an opportunity to ask questions that they have, because we're coming up on time. Before we do that, I do want to, I do want to, I want to go back to Art Leahy and to Zev uh, on an issue. One of the successes that we've had in all this work and the widening and the efforts to relieve uh, congestion was the 405, Carmageddon. Uh, some people were betting against uh, Metro and Caltrans on that. Uh, they lost. It turned out to be a very successful uh, effort. What lessons did we learn from that, if any? Well, first of all, uh, it's good to have a one-word uh, description of the project that conveys the impression uh, to every man, woman, and child in the world of what, what was at stake. And uh, uh, I did not invent Carmageddon. Somebody whispered it in my ear, but I mentioned it at our press conference, and it took off like, like wildfire. And it became, and everybody in this town knew when you talked about Carmageddon what it meant. So it, 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 it had the desired result. It got people's attention. And John is right. Information is everything. And our objective was in Carmageddon is to give every Angelino the information about what was going to happen. We started three months ahead of time, and the objective was that on Carmageddon weekend that there shouldn't be a man, woman, or child in this town who doesn't know that this is the weekend that we're closing the 405 freeway. And it worked. Uh, and my philosophy has always been, my experience has been, that Angelinos know what to do with their cars uh, if, if they just have the information. If there's a closure on Wilshire Boulevard, they know how to get around it. If there's a closure on 405, they'll know how to work around it. Uh, and in the case of the 405, they didn't, they didn't work around it. They just di they took our advice and stayed home. What's the lesson from all of this? The, the lesson is, uh, here's the lesson not to take from this. This, was, th this is not a template for, uh, for the way we're going to do business in the future. This was a one weekend thing. It had tremendous economic impacts on a lot of people. Uh, when I flew over it in a helicopter uh, went, went, and went down PCH to see what the impact on PCH was, in the middle of July on a weekend, there wasn't one person on the beach between Santa Monica Pier and Topanga Beach. Now, that, that's a big weekend for the businesses at the beach. Uh, they could handle it one weekend. They didn't like it. They couldn't do this on, an annual, on a regular basis. However, what it does tell us, what less that we can draw from it, is that when we all pull together, and we all have a common goal. We did this in the 1984 Olympics, and we did it again on Carmageddon weekend. We can, we can pull together in a, in a direction that helps mitigate a problem, whether it's traffic or whether it's anything else. Uh, people are willing to contribute to a solution, or to an evasion of a problem, if they believe that everybody's going to play by the same rules. And in this particular weekend, everybody did play by the same rules. Traffic wasn't just down on the 405 corridor or the, or the I-10 corridor. It was all over the county. Traffic was down all over the county. Interesting thing, if you read my website, uh, which you should, uh, uh, we had a story on our website after Carmageddon weekend about what the collateral impacts were. Crime went down significantly. Emergency room visits went down, not because people couldn't get there, but because I guess there's less anxiety or people, not all people who go to emergency rooms need them, so they didn't bother to get on the road to do that. There were a whole series of things that, that the positive benefit as a result of Carmageddon weekend. And the reason for it is that people bought into the, to the message that all of us uh, conveyed to them over a period of, of many weeks. We're going to get to do it again next summer, and uh, my, my ex expectation is that people are going to cooperate again. It's, the, this was not a false alarm. This was not a question of exaggeration. This, w this was a question of successful participation of the public, which resulted in this dramatic success. Uh, and I think that people are going to want to do it again. But it was a... Uh, it, it, was, it was quite something, and uh, John, the information, uh, I, I calculated, I, I asked uh, somebody at Universal Studios here, uh, asked Ron Meyer, uh, who runs Universal Studios, what, 
how much do you spend promoting a movie? You know, a big movie. He says, well, it's typically there's a certain percentage, you know, uh, that we spend on it is like fifty million dollars on a on a on a movie uh, to to promote it nationwide. The the value of the public relations campaign that we didn't spend the nickel on, but went viral. Uh, I I can't I don't even know. Maybe there's a public relations person here who can who can give us an idea of over a two or three week period how much that was worth. How how much would we have had to pay? To, to get that kind of a uh, of a penetration in LA County, we had tremendous cooperation from the media. It was a once in a lifetime thing. Probably never happen again on that level. Uh, but when you do penetrate people's consciousness, they respond. And Angelinos, if nothing else, are experts with their automobiles. They know how to drive and they know how to get around congestion if there is an alternative. And they did it. I, I just want to comment on the closing minutes of the uh, of the closure. It turned into an L.A. moment up there on the hill. Uh, the press event had just wrapped up. There were 15 helicopters, a big, a group of media guys bigger than this room. And, but it's Hollywood, right? It's Hollywood. It's okay. So the freeway is not going to open. So what comes through first but a fire truck, with a bunch of sirens, police cars, lights on, American flags. Then the citizens start coming through, and they see us up on this knoll. And people are driving by going, yay, victory, you know, and all this stuff. All we did was open the freeway. You know, <laughs> I say this to reinforce Zev's point. They knew what was going on. They understood it. They took part in it. And they were celebrating the, the success that we had. Very good. Let's uh, open it up to questions from the uh, group here. Uh, we still have some time left. Any hands? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> but I wanted to ask about some of the other uh, things that we talked about in the past that are here now. Like, uh, issues like jobs, housing, balance, and other ways to reduce uh, coal fuel miles, traffic, or whatever. Are those still part of the ongoing discussions? I think that's got to yeah. be to you. <laughs> uh, I think they are, and I think what we're seeing, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, but I, I worked away for about 12, 13 years. I came back to the MTA a couple, two and a half years ago. And so I must tell you, returning was a bit of a shock to see what's happening all around LA and even Orange County uh, in terms of housing around train stations, housing in downtown Los Angeles, um, housing in Hollywood, housing in other places, what's happening on Ventura Boulevard and Burbank. We are seeing a shift in how things, uh, in how we're developing housing and commercial activity around each other. I have a son who's a deputy district attorney. He lives in Los Angeles. He would no more live in Riverside or someplace like that and commute for an hour and a half or two hours than fly to the moon. I think what we're seeing is a shift in attitudes amongst younger people. Uh, I think we're going to, this is going to accelerate because of the problems in the Inland Empire. If we, if you come down, to, uh, if you come to LA or Hollywood and walk around and look at what's going on, uh, with housing, I think it's a it's a pretty stunning development. Same in Pasadena, by the way. Um, if, if I can just add, uh, just briefly, I think you also are seeing um, the growth of people working from home um, to avoid congestion. Uh, the latest census data says that in Los Angeles, uh, six percent of the population actually works from home. Um, you know, people and companies are starting to realize that if I want people to show up to work a full day, I don't need to have them come into the office. The growth of technology, the, the advance of innovation is providing fantastic opportunities to reduce congestion as well. So that's something I think you'll see more of. You know, the, the, the old concern was how am I going to keep tabs on people working from home? Well, now you have IP telephony that will allow you to listen in on a phone call if you have a customer service per person answering the phones from their house. You know, there's, there's all sorts of technological advances that are making it possible, and, and the resistance is on the control front. The people who want to control who's working for them and control how they're working um, that, are, that are not... Um, realizing the full advantages that are available. Reason is a virtual organization. We're in 14 states. We're 45 people. You know, we, we have expectations from our employees that are related to performance. 
we are not going to ask them to live in California or live in Washington, D.C. We're going to ask them to perform. And then we're going to measure their performance against the results of what they get done. So. Just make one, one, one more comment before on, on the jobs housing balance. Uh, one of the things that's contributing to the regional traffic problem in Southern California uh, is not just a lack of jobs housing balance like we see here in the valley. Uh, the, you know, 25 years ago, the predominant traffic in the AM peak was inbound towards downtown and the outbound in the in the PM peak. Uh, today it's as congested, it can't be as congested going outbound to Warner Center as it is coming inbound to uh, to the county, uh, to, to the uh, to downtown Los Angeles. Uh, the the, go, the uh, orange line tra uh, passenger load is as high going outbound uh, as it is coming inbound in, in the uh, in, in the AM peak. In the West Los Angeles area, Santa Monica is a job rich area, but most of the people who live there, can't, uh, who work there, can't afford to live there. So they live points east, uh, San Gabriel Valley, even, even in the eastern in the in Inland Empire. That's why the Exposition Light Rail Line, which uh, is, is the first phase of which is almost open and the second phase of which we just broke ground on, is going to be one of the most heavily used light rail lines in the country. However, uh, Land use is a, is a major contributing factor to this, too. Uh, the New Hall Ranch project, uh, the Tahone Ranch project, which are going to build tens of thousands of new homes out in the North County area in the southern part of Kern County. Uh, I'm not going to get into a land use debate about this, but the implications of this uh, for traffic, sorry, the implications of this for traffic are are obvious. Uh, traffic on the 405, on the I-5, uh, as more people live out there, and we're not building any, any job capacity out there, they're all working here in the valley or on the other side of the hill, uh, the implications for that are self-evident. They're, they're only, this is, the, the I-5 is the Mississippi River and we have tributaries, uh, tributaries to, the, to the river. If those tributaries overflow, the whole system overflows and that's that's a concern that we need to have so the county and this is in my backyard uh, in, in my uh, on my watch uh, in my shop the county is approving developments out in the north county area uh, who arguably whose infrastructure where, where there isn't enough inf infrastructure to handle it either from a traffic or from a water or from a, other points of view and this is going to be this is going to contribute to a jobs housing imbalance now what's the alternative to that is also very politically difficult, but it's happening. The alternative to that is to build more infill housing in the places where there already are jobs. Uh, downtown Los Angeles, is, as Art said, is experiencing a dramatic uh, increase in that regard. Hollywood is experiencing an increase in that regard. Housing is being built along our rail lines and along the Orange Line, uh, for that matter. Uh, uh, all of our rail lines and the Orange Line, because people want to live near public transportation. But expanding out into the exurbs, we invented suburbs, now we've invented exurbs, is, is something that uh, is going to have consequences. So the issue is there was an article in the paper that talked about balances in funds from, from bond. One B is our bond program that we're administering uh, that seem rather large and that we're not being drawn down on. We just had a meeting on this this week in Sacramento. Back on Tuesday, I was up there with the Treasurer and, and Department of Finance and others. What's really happening is uh, when we allocate money and people go to bid on contracts, uh, we're putting money aside to pay the contractors as the work is done. Okay. And so we're trying to get an estimate of how much to reserve. So in those accounts, there was a reserve of about $2 billion. 
because we have, when the bills come, we've got to pay them. And what happens in those situations, for example, in Los Angeles County, LA County Metro may be doing the work, then they will, they're putting out the first dollar, but then they're coming back to the state and saying, reimburse us for, our, for the, that portion of those funds that comes from the bond money. What we're trying to do is work to get a better and more real-time, accurate estimate of the cash flow needs. Uh, because right now we're sort of guessing. We're saying, well, it could be this. So we're sort of going on the high end uh, of, of that estimate. And so one of the conversations we had this week was working with the Treasurer's Office, the Department of Finance, and others, because this is a, has to be a coordinated thing, because we're talking to the Treasurer about when you're going to sell bonds, how much of that should be the 1B bonds. We're talking about the Department of Finance, because they're figuring the debt service. They need to know how much money do you need. We're talking to Caltrans and others. So we're trying to make that work better. But I want to emphasize that on project delivery, we have done a very good job, one, of getting projects delivered early ahead of schedule because the agencies are working very hard, even Caltrans are working very hard. We've had a lot of success stories. The other thing we've been very successful at this year is reducing costs. Because of the economy, we have gone out and we have come back on projects where the actual cost of the project was below the bid that was awarded to the, by, by the contractor. So we're taking those dollars and we're reprogramming pre -programming those into other projects now. And we've been very aggressive on that. So I think that article was a, by George Skelton was a little misleading because it's, it, it's more complicated by that, but it's a very good question. Other questions? You, just sir, you, you had your hand up before, I'm sorry. Uh, 